Ray. You're listening to Hawk Talk. I'm here today with Ravi Drums. How are you? Man, I am good. How are you, brother? I'm good. I love the setup behind you, by the way. That's uh, got the Right here, here. I'll move so you can yeah. see it. <laughs> yeah, for those listening, it is quite a machine you guys need to look up. But uh, well, There's one rig here. There's one rig there. Yeah. There's the, uh, the Dave Grohl, Taylor Hawkins rig in the corner. There and uh, then I got this over here. It's a, we got all kinds of things happening. That's amazing. I'm going to try and, That's fine. try and frame myself right in between it. There it is. Otherwise, it look kind of foolish. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm, I'm in a video That's game. Right. Yeah. And so, got to start it off. I assume, obviously, you know, you're you're born, you come out in the delivery room, and you just start banging on shit. Is that is that how this all? That was off? it. My mom said I was kicking nonstop, like <laughs> like I was a drummer in Slayer. <laughs> was that in the womb, or is that at least after you got out? <laughs> no, she was. She was saying in the womb, I kicked. I was irritating as hell. From the get go, <laughs> from even before I got here, I was I was loud and kicking and, and annoying. No, it really did start right away. All right, where and where were you born? Where you where did it all start? I was born in upstate New York in Poughkeepsie. I'm oh, Poughkeepsie. I've been. Um, yeah. My friend. I can't even spell it, but I've been. There. I was born there. Like, it's like dough, right? It's like Poughkeepsie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's got the oh, dough in it, and uh, yeah. Um, yeah, no. My one of my best friends went to the Corner Institute up there. One of the top culinary schools in the U.S. is there. Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Really famous one. Yep. Looks like Hogwarts. It's a cool spot. Um, all right. So you're born in Poughkeepsie. Uh, tell me childhood. Like you come out, like truly, did you come out and you were banging on stuff? And you were a drummer from like the moment you could swing things? I was a drummer from, from birth, 100%. Because I remember my first memory is me crying for a blue sparkle drum set at Kmart. Wow. Right. You okay. know, remember it was like a blue yeah. sparker, and then there was a silver one called Sterling Steel or Sterling Silver or something like that, and they had two of them, and I wanted the blue sparkle one, maybe because you know Ringo had something that looked more like that, right? Yeah. And I was three, three and a half, and that, that was a time in America where you could go leave your kid in the toy section at Kmart and go around and get yeah. whatever you needed and come back, and they'd still be there, and there was no problem. <laughs> so they would leave me there. And I would just look up in amazement, like, oh. and yeah. then, but they, they had to pay the price. And then I got a spanking every time we leave. I'm like, I need, and they would have to carry me sideways. I would knock everything down, crying for it, trying to grab it. I literally, yeah, I remember being spanked and like pulling out of there. <laughs> no, you're not getting it. Don't do the drum. Why do you need this? Yeah, here's something at home. So then, and, uh, and where did it come from? Like, what, what, what do you like? Have, I guess you probably wouldn't have the memory, but do you know, like, did your parents tell you where your desire to drum came from? Like, did you watch Ringo? Does it like, or is this like sounded cool? Um, you know what? I don't know. Like, I think, you know, like as Indians, right. Um, they're always playing those Hindi songs, you know, did the you, Bollywood you song. The, the top less? Did you get it, ever get into the top? I, list? I did. I did learn from oh. like the most famous, well, one of the most famous film tabla players in the world when I was like 12 in, Bombay. We used to go every other summer for like six weeks, but, um, but you know, that's later, but I was like three and a half and I cried and cried and wanted a drum set and wanted a drum set. And my entire life, I just wanted drums and drums and drums. Then they had the Columbia record club, right? On Sundays. Yeah. And uh, you'd get the parade magazine. You could get 13 records for one penny. Like, dad, we got to do it. Dad, we got to do it. Dad, we got to do it. My, you know, I cried every Sunday. We got it. I need these records. I can't live. You know, I'm like, finally they gave it. I wore them down. And then I got, um, I went to a friend. I was in the T-ball league or something in second grade. And one of the kids, the kid's coach, uh, the coach's son had a birthday party and all the kids came. And they had all the Kiss records, <laughs> right? Yeah. And it was the first time I saw Rock and Roll Over and Kiss Destroyer. And I just looked at them all night, like, who are these magical, devilish superheroes? Who's this cat and the space guy and the devil and the rock star? And I lost my mind. I was just completely psychotic. Once it was like about seven. Yeah, 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 yeah. Second grade. Yeah, I remember it was second grade T-ball, and then and then Kiss, and then I got my dad to get the records, and we got like Van Halen and Ted Nugent and Queen. And, uh, you know, that was back when they had killer record covers. Yeah. All of those record covers, Queen, the big green guy coming into the dome, the yeah. Boston flying space city on a thing, and then the Kiss records. And then my dad had the Beatles records and all kinds of others. And, you know, they, you know, 
they were always just playing tunes. So I guess those rhythms were always dancing around. But Same I always had the energy. And what, you know? what what did your parents do? What did your dad and mom do? Oh, they're, they're proper good Indian people. <laughs> they're not doing any of this entertainment, nice haircut, not crazy. Um, <laughs> the proper, the proper good Indians. You know, I'm the one that went bad. They, everything went wrong. They're like, they will think you are the son of a butt doctor if you keep it like this. <laughs> That's an Indian joke. I can say it. I'm Indian. Everybody relax. I actually taught school in India, so I spent some real time out there. Oh, um, that's right. You told me that. It's, a, it's good reminiscing, remembering all the jokes they cracked about me. Remember, yeah. uh, I did, I, I don't know if I told you this, I uh, was asked to participate in their like spring arts festival at the school, and they yeah. had a thing where you like put your head in the circle and people throw sponges at you. And throw and they're like uh, they were telling me like oh this is Hindi like you should say this and it'll get people excited say Maru Ferangi Ko and I'm like okay so I'm yelling it and all the parents are giving me weird looks as they're walking by I'm yelling it trying to get they, you know they told me that's what will get people interested and some people laughed and threw some punches so I got like the you know feedback I was like all right it's working kept doing it finally one of the teachers goes do you know what you're saying I'm like no they're like you're saying kill the white man <laughs> <laughs> oh Maru Ferangi Ko okay got it got it I'm like, I didn't get it, but now I do. Okay, yeah. it took me a second. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, hits. Yeah, hit the white man. Oh, yeah. my God. That's so funny. Yeah. Maru. Maru yeah. lagi. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, you nailed it. Exactly. So, oh, yeah. all right. So, and what, you, but, it, so what did your parents do? What would your dad do, your mom do? What oh, so, so my, fa- my father worked at IBM. Okay, got it. So he, like, it's crazy. My, their story is, it's unbelievable. It's a movie. I got to turn it into a movie. I just, Maybe now with chat GPT, I could like eventually yeah, like right, turn this right. into the script it needs to be. But it's a crazy story. So I'll, I'll go back because it's really interesting. Um, so my dad and mom were married. My dad was 18. My mom was 12. Full tribal, wow. like no, you know, they lived out in villages, like no running water. No, My mother's village, right, just got electricity in 1986. Wow. So they got it in 1985. Literally, wires are hanging like full Thomas Edison, you know, gangs in New York. Like, that's what it looked yeah. like in 1985. Yeah. And it would go out 10 times a night, no running water. My grandmother used to have to take three um, burthens, is what they called uh, these like uh, clay, not, not clay, but they were um, copper pots. Uh-huh. One it would hold the smaller one and then a smaller one. Yeah. She would have to go down there go to a lake where the buffalo were swimming and people were yep. washing and this, that, the other. And that was their only water source. She would go there and just have like a towel over it. And that was the filter. That was the yep. filtered water. So yep. no dirt came in. Yep. Then they would boil it for us. But for them, they wouldn't, they didn't need to boil it because they were used to the bacteria and whatever. Rock hard stomachs. <laughs> rock hard, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like well, Arnold and uh, the rock have nothing on them. Yeah. <laughs> as far as stomach strength. <laughs> They would be crying like women, like like little school children. Um, so they got married, super tribal, super young. And then my, but before, the, so my father's, my grandfather was a gambler, right? And the biggest insult for any man, especially tribal like this, right? Because you got nothing, was to get so low you had to sell your wife's wedding jewelry because it was part of the dowry, right? Uh-huh. It was a whole dowry system. So he gambled and he lost the money. And then he had to sell uh, my grandmother's jewelry to pay the debt. Wow. And, you know, there might have been a drought that year, so they couldn't farm. I don't even know. So then after that, he was shamed so hard, so personally shamed, he had a stroke. So then he couldn't really work. So then my uncle, at 10 years old, had to ride on top of a, um, maybe he was eight. He had to ride on top of a train, full slumdog millionaire, like for real, yeah. with one of the other uncles. And they went for three days on top of a train to from Rajasthan to Mumbai, through the desert, you know, all the way to Mumbai. And it took forever back then, right? It was yeah. some old British railway. And the Britishers had theirs, and then the Indians had some old sloppy beat-up thing, right? Yeah. So, um and this was like a long, long, long time ago. Um, yeah, I mean, right after, this was right after India gained freedom, I guess, right? Yeah. So um, probably like 1954, somewhere around there. Yeah. Um, oh, no, maybe even before that, maybe like 51 or two. 
something like that. I don't even know. Yeah. They don't even know. My dad was born in his house with no birth certificate. You know. Like, oh yeah. 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 Full on, like full tribal, right? Yeah. And so my uncle, at ten years old, had to work to feed the whole family because the women couldn't work. Then, wow. Right. Women didn't yeah. work. Right. They, you know, they they could maybe cook in a kitchen that a family a male owned, if a male family member owned. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then they make a penny, you know, yeah. here and there, or whatever, or they'd get food or something, right? Yeah. So he went there to Mumbai for three days, lived on some distant relative's floor. He had like a couple of towels that he just kind of like, that was his bed. Mm-hmm. And so we were from the Marwadi caste and it was super prejudiced with the, with the caste system there. Yeah. So he would deliver food, like they have the birthing system there, right? You know, all the little thalis. Yeah. The, uh, if you don't know, the thalis are these uh, the little round cylinder... Uh, tins, they're tins, lunch tins, and they'll make fresh food and they bring it to everybody, right? And it's this crazy system that works that nobody from the West could ever figure out. And no, there's no names, and it's just a little writing, you know, like etched into them. So he's from the Marwadi uh, cast, right? We are. Yeah. And so he would, he could only deliver to Marwadi's, right? Because nobody else yeah, would yeah, food. Exactly. You know, you had to be from your cast. Yeah. So it's monsoon, and in monsoon in Mumbai, it floods, it's terrible, it's brutal. So he's 10 years old, and he's delivering, you know, up multiple stories, and the guy pays him, and, you know, for the week or whatever, and it's over, like 10 cents over. And he's, my uncle, so religious and so by the book that he comes back in the rain after 30 minutes and says, you gave me too much, here's your change back. And the guy's like, what are you doing? Like, just yeah. keep it. He's like, no, no, I can't. It's not mine. He goes, sit down, dry out. Why are you not in school? And so he tells him, hey, my, my father lost all the money. So I have a father, a mother, and two sisters that I have to take care of. And he's like, you're 10. He's like, bro, that's the gig. Okay. So guys, like, check this out. You're going to deliver to me, tea to me every day at 435. And for 10 minutes, I'm going to teach you math. So you hurry on the other ones and you get yourself 10 minutes. So, you know, you're on it and I'm going to teach you how to do math because otherwise this is all you're ever going to be. You're yeah. not going to have a chance for school. You, you got nothing. If you don't learn math, at least with math, you could start here. You could, you could get a job and count books and you can do something. Cause he was, the guy was an accountant, right? A CPA, yeah. so a charter, chartered accountant, as we say that. So then the guy taught him how to do math. Fast forward he became the owner of the company and it became national jute mills. So Nash, everything was nationalized, was socialized, right? And everything was burlap, you know, in India's, they still use burlap bags. So yeah. national jute was the national maker of burlap bags where all the grains and, food wow. and everything was transported. So he got a franchise of national jute in Mumbai. It's not a bad place, and a franchise. This is, 20 years, like, and I mean, the franchise just means four guys sitting on a bed counting the thing. And then there's a bunch of like dudes on the ground level, like moving all the jute and distributing it. That, that's what a franchise means. There's yeah. no building and bathroom and air conditioning. And <laughs> it, you know, it's like four old Indian men sitting on a, on a thing. But what's crazy was like, because he didn't get to go to school and he didn't get an education. He's like, he told my dad, you're going to school and you're going to college. Now, what's and, the age difference between them? Um, I think it was eight years. Okay. So my dad was just born and then everything yeah. went bad. And then he had to take care of, he had yeah. to take care of, what was it? My grandfather, my grandmother, two sisters, and five people he had to take care of at 10, at years, 10 old. years old. Yeah. He was the only one that could earn, right? Okay. The women could, you know, they, the girls, young school girls couldn't earn any money. Well, yep. you, know, you know, not not legally or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, and they're super, yeah, no, and they're super, super hyper religious. I mean, yeah. never had an egg, never a fully vegetarian, never any yeah. alcohol. Like, I mean, super devout religious. Like, yeah. That was the only thing, that was the only hope they had, right? Yeah. So after, you know, my uncle, after about 10 years starts, he gets a job as a CPA at National Jew, right? And he's, he's just a worker there, right? But he's one of the guys. So now he moves the family to Mumbai. 
and he gets my father to finish his last year of high school. And there the exams are super hard. And my dad did really well. And he was an athlete. So he was on the cricket team and that helped him get into college. So, you know, uh, he did really well in high school. He was like number three because there's a ranking system, right? There's no participation trophies. Number one, number two, number three, in order. That's it, right? Yep. And everything is based on the exam. So can you imagine, like, people, oh, the like, they take college and or high school and college in India just to, the, we don't hold a candle to it here. It's crazy. No, it's crazy. Like, how is this little tribal society, like, yeah. like you know, but that's why all those smart Indians have come here, right? But so my dad did really well. And then he also played cricket and was captain of the cricket team. So yeah. he got into a good school. Yeah. Otherwise, they couldn't have afforded it. Then he did really well there. And then America at the time was doing a search all throughout Asia because America knew it needed more doctors and it needed more engineers in order to build the future. Yeah. Right. So if they we were only going about that. We, if we only thought that way these days. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, but but it's amazing. America back then was really America. Like, let's, yeah, let's right. build. Yeah. Build the future. OK, so what we need is. We'll get the smartest people from around the world and bring them all here. Yeah. And then they'll be Americans. And then they're part of here. And right. It worked. <laughs> it absolutely. Well, that's why every Indian you meet generally was an engineer or a doctor, because that's what America needed. And those were yeah. the only ones that they accepted. So my dad graduated his, uh, you know, he got his bachelor's in electrical engineering. And then they were like America, 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 right? The American dream. And so everyone was like, <clears throat> if he goes to America, my uncle, some of the uncle's friends are like, he's done well in school. If he goes to America, $1 there is worth 80 here, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. if you just magnify that. Even when build- I went in 2003, you could live like kings off nothing. Yeah, 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 okay. absolutely. But then they also have all the expensive stuff too. So you could just yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you could easily spend as much. Yeah. I just did on my last trip because we balled out. I wanted my kids to be inspired. Yeah. But um, so they were what they did was my uncle was very affluent or very well respected throughout the Marwadi community. And he if people got in arguments and this, that, the other, he would help settle the arguments, right? Yeah. So um, and that's just kind of, it was very tribal still. Yep. Um, so he went to 50 Marwadi families and he said, listen, we can't afford this, but if you give us 2000 rupees each, everybody can afford that. We'll pay it all back. You know, we will. I have the most honorable name and we're going to send him to America and he can do good for all of us. And then we can all start migrating. Right. Wow. So they had to borrow from 50 families to get enough money. And this is really interesting. So back then England was trying to populate Australia. So they would fill their like cruise ships or whatever. I mean, not a fabulous, like the way they have them now, but it's more like a Titanic and they're in the bottom. Right. Um, So they would fill their cruise ships with um, English citizens from England and they were uh, populating Australia on the way back. They would stop and refuel in Mumbai. So what they would do is they would offer the fares super cheap in the lowest class on the boat. And then you could get to England. So, and that was like six weeks to go from India to England. And so they got the cheapest fare. My dad had never used a spoon because, you know, they eat with their hands and this, that, the other. Never sat on the toilet. They didn't know anything and nobody ever prepped them because no one else ever did it. It falls in the ground and it's eating with your hands. And you use one hand for one, one hand for the other, to be clear. Yeah, yeah, that's it. They were like, they were there for like three days. Like, how do we eat? What do we do? And they're like looking at everybody in the dining cart going, like, how do you do this? You know, missing and dropping all over their clothes, the whole bit. (laughs) So it takes him about two months and then he gets to the port port of New York. Uh And he only had $8 in a one-way ticket, right? But $8 was probably like, you know, a few hundred bucks, right? Yeah. Compared yeah. To, to today. So there was enough food for like a month and he was going to West Virginia College. So the dorm was already paid for and there was like a meal program. So he had like, you know, 
eight bucks. And that my published music publishing company is called eight dollars in a suitcase. That's what my dad had coming. Yeah. So they were all excited when they got to the port of New York and they're like, oh my God, we're here, we're here. They run outside and they're like, it's so cold. He's like, I've never been more cold than that in, in that one moment of my entire life. Cause he didn't even have shoes. He had chuppels. You know, yeah. chuppels are Indian sandals, right? Yeah. The camels, camel leather chuppel. So that's all he had. He didn't even have covered shoes. They didn't know any better. They, yeah. they didn't need them right? in yeah. India. And you always have to take your shoes off in America, you leave your shoes on. They're like yeah. totally foreign, like yeah. no idea. And so they get there and he's so cold. He had two suits. He's like, I had to put on all of my clothes at once to go out there so we could look at the Statue of Liberty as we were coming here. Uh -huh. So yeah. then he graduated college and he got a job at Westinghouse, which was like, oh yeah. my Great. God, you, you've won the lottery. Then yeah. he did a really good job because he was so honest and he couldn't cheat and he couldn't lie. And he had no, like, it was just not even within the realm of possibility for my dad. And so he stopped production on all kinds of like light bulb and all these dudes are like, what are you talking about? We got to get these light bulbs. He goes, I can't, it's my name. I can't do it. He stopped production like four times. He goes, everybody's pissed off because now they got to work late and everybody hated him except the boss. Right. You know, and then, so he kept moving up. He goes, look, this guy's so honest. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. Um, Cause he doesn't know how to lie. It wasn't even yeah. within the pantheon of anything he would do for fear of getting thrown out of the country and, yeah. and just the way he was raised. So then he got headhunted to IBM. And he went and told his boss, hey, this guy's IBM, listen, I'm so, I don't want to leave. You guys have been so good to me, but they're offering me you know, double the money. The guy says, listen, son, <laughs> this is America. If IBM offered me a job, I'll leave here now too. So you go yeah. get that job. And then later on, my dad, help lay the T1 lines down that helped develop the internet. And the, because yeah. it, the T1 lines were originally for the military and the banking system between New York, Washington, and Chicago, right? And so it was a triple backup. So he helped develop those lines, the T1 lines for IBM, which wow. laid, which later became yeah. the internet. Yeah. So it's like crazy. And now I got a Mohawk and I met my wife at the Playboy. Network. I was just saying, so wait, take it back. Fuck, I mean, that, that is a... Wait, how'd you meet your wife? What did you just say? <laughs> I met her at the Playboy Mansion. I'm like, Dad, I oh, am the American. There you go. Yeah. No, but Me by the way, with that, that I I appreciate the background because, like, again, this whole podcast is about like how did you become who you are, and there's so much about who your parents are that leads to that. That your dad came from nothing and really created this, and then, frankly, set it up that you could go do this thing that, as you joked about, was like, you know, not he doesn't even know what to make of it, but that is what what no. comes. From. And so, so I'm curious. So. Seven, seven years old, you, to take it back there, you discover Kiss, you discover rock and roll in a lot of ways. Yes. But did you start drumming then? Did you get a drum set? Like, at what point did you finally? No, no, I kept begging for a drum set, begging for a drum set. So, like, I did odd jobs to make a, a fit 25 cents, 25 cents. There. When I was in fourth grade, I finally got a pair of drumsticks and a, and a practice pad. Okay, you know how it's like, but yeah, so you're about nine years old. Nine years old. I, I stepped up. I finally got a pair of drumsticks in ninth grade. And I got a practice pad. Sticks, you said. Oh, sticks and a practice pad. So not a set, just sticks and a pad. No, so it's, you know, it's like basically a muffled drum head. It's a, like, it's a piece of rubber at this yeah. point. It's a brown yeah. piece of rubber that yeah. says WF Ludwig on it with a circle yeah. and it's shaped like a, like, like a triangle, right? And then yeah. you have these two skinny little jazz drumsticks. And it was so not kissed. Right here's Peter <laughs> Chris like exploding, and I'm like, "This sucks! I hate it." Well, man, you want to learn how to drum? That's how you drum. That's how you start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you you was that your parents? Like, where'd you get that? How'd that happen? Oh, my dad. My dad bought that for me. So then I'm like, I need a drum set like this. Yeah. It's okay. You should get one. Yep. Okay. So I'm like, well, I'm, I'm ten. You know, at, the, at, the, at this point, I'm eight and ten. He goes, well, that's not my problem. That's yours. Figure it out. Oh God. You need to get a job. Crazy. You need to work. You need to you need you need to get this. You get it. I'm not gonna go spend a thousand bucks on a toy for sit in your closet, just like all the other games we bought you that you don't play. We're not. Yeah. So it. funny enough, I've got two guitars sitting here. When I was eight, I wanted to be a guitarist. I just realized I wasn't that good, so I didn't end up doing it professionally. But I enjoyed it. I went to my dad at eight years old and said, "I need an electric guitar," and he said, "Good, get a fucking job." Yeah. That's that's the same thing. Like, uh, okay. And so, but that's the thing. When you're that age, you kind of like, uh, okay, I gotta go figure it out. Like you don't really like. 
what are you talking about? I'm eight. Like, you don't have this negotiation with your parents about not being able to work. You're just like, okay, I'll go figure it out. No, no, no. My, my dad said, I said, I, I, I told him, I, I, was, I remember I was 10 years old. And I was like, dad, I got to get this drum set. And he goes, yeah, you should get it. He goes, dad, you got to come. You got to, uh, no, I know what it was. I was like, you got to come see this drum set. We were on vacation. I lived in Houston, Texas at this point. And then my dad was doing something in Dallas. And we stayed at some hotel. And there was a mall in the hotel. And then there was a music store. And I went yeah. down to the end of the music store and stared at the drums all day, right? They had all these stacks and these clear acrylic drums. My dad dragged my dad, dragged my dad. Dad, 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 you got to come. You got to come see this. I go, dad, I need this drum set. He goes, yeah, you should get it. I'm like, oh, my God, let's get it. He goes, well, you don't have any money. I go, I'm 10. He goes, you got to figure that out. That's your problem. I got everything I need. I got my car. I got my house. I'm good. He goes, but I'll tell you what. I'll let you use my lawnmower and my weed eater, and I'll even help you make flyers. We'll go to the printing shop. We'll print out flyers. You can go ask all the neighbors. Maybe you can mow their yards. You can edge their yards, and you can weed eat, right? And he goes, I'll, I'll let you use my mower for free. I'm like, okay. <laughs> he goes, because in business, you would rent the mower to the, to the thing, and then, you know, you're trying to teach me business. Yeah. So, I'm mowing yards for, you know, 10. And I'm like, at 12 years old, you could get a job throwing the newspaper. But you had to be 12 to throw the newspaper. Yeah. You can't even throw, kids can't even get a newspaper job. So I, I called every year, you know, 10. I called a couple of times. I'm like, I'm 12. And they're like, you're not. You know, my squeaky little voice, you know, skinny little Indian kid. I must have weighed 60 pounds, you know. <laughs> and so I'm 12. I hit the big time. I can get a job at the paper. So I, I throw the Houston Chronicle. And what's crazy is I didn't even realize this until I was like 35, I gave an interview. But throwing the newspaper taught me everything I needed about sacrifice. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Because I couldn't be on the swim team or wrestling team or gymnastics or do anything, right? Because I had to throw the newspaper after school. So while all the kids were out playing, you know, after school, like as soon as I came home from school, I had a snack and I had to wrap the papers and then I had to throw them. That was yeah. my day every day, right? I didn't get to go hang out and play football and go to the swimming pool or do any of that stuff. And then on the weekends, <coughs> you had to wake up at like 4.30 because people were out in the road drinking coffee at 6 expecting their paper, especially on yeah. Sunday. And, dude, I'm like 60 pounds. This giant Sunday newspaper is so heavy, right? The bike was so big. It was one of those Pee Wee Hermans, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm like this tiny, skinny little Indian kid. And we had a slope on the driveway. So I'd have to lean it up on the side. I'd fill up both saddlebags, right? Those canvas yeah. saddlebags with the, with the Houston Chronicle. And then I'd have to kick off the side of the, the garage or the side of the house, the garage, and then get momentum and yeah. wobble down. So I would have to do the houses close to my house at the end because I'd pass them and I couldn't turn around. Yeah. So it was literally like the first house is like five houses down on the left or right. So yeah. I'm like wobbling, trying not to fall. And if you fell, I mean, it was it. Game over. Like, you know, like there was just no, there was no comeback from that. You had yeah. to like go and unload, go all the way back up, restart. Because it, oh, yeah. it was way too small. I couldn't ever get the momentum. So I fell down once and it took two hours. Everyone was mad. Complaints everywhere. So anyway, I got my job. So <laughs> I was 12. I remember I, after years of work, yeah. years of suffering or work, you know how much money I had? I had $264. Yep. <laughs> and maybe 84 cents. For some reason, that, that number keeps ringing up. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but I'm going to go with it. Yeah. And so then my dad kicks in the rest. You know, he kicked in, that's whatever, 700 bucks. And yeah. then he's like, when we moved to Florida, at, at that point, uh, we were moving to Florida my dad took a job, you know, he, he's still working for IBM. Uh -huh. And um, we moved to Florida, and for Christmas, I got a drum set, and then that was it. It was on. Yeah. So you were 12 when you finally got your drum set? I was 12 when I finally got my drum set. Yeah, from that's... Thoroughbred Music, from AJ Altieri. I still know AJ. And, uh, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, Thoroughbred Music was this iconic drum shop, and any touring Where musician is in Tampa, Florida. Okay, cool. Nice. Yeah, so then I started doing that, and then I was playing, like, in rock bands, and I was, like, co-captain of the drum line in high school. Yeah. I went to University of South Florida, yep. and I was in the orchestra and the wind ensemble and the jazz ensemble, and 
And then after, you know, I, I was like a shredding drummer. I mean, shredding. I killed it. Like, way better than I am now. Like, I've got a thing now. But back then, I was the most kick-ass drummer. I mean, I used to play during summer sometimes like 10 hours a day. Wow. I was just psycho. You truly it. loved it. That's awesome. Well, I knew I had to get good to get what I wanted. Got it. So, and, and, was, I, and I loved Back then, what, was, what did you want back then? Was it to be a rock and roll drummer? Or like- I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted yeah. to be a rock okay. drummer. I wanted to be part Peter Chris, mainly Neil Peart, though, at that yeah. point. Yeah, there you go. I wanted to be Neil Peart. I yeah. saw Rush 21 times, I think. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. As a young man, I, I went to every show. They would play at Lakeland Civic Center. I'd go all three nights. Wow. You know, I, it. Yeah, it was just like, dude, I would go. And then I would air drum everything like I was rehearsing and learning. And my friends would go with me, and they were like, we would watch you air drum to see how accurate you were. And you could just like, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, awesome. Neil, was, Neil Port was God to me. And, and when then, did uh, you, and you're, so you were doing all these things in high school, and you were a part of all these uh, and at USF, uh, at what point did you go, this is like, I'm, I'm good enough. Like, obviously you wanted it, but where, when did the confidence kick in? Like, I'm going to be a rock star. 12. Oh, awesome. Just started. Yeah. I did my first gig like six months into it. I'm like, that's it. That's it. I'm doing this. Yeah. I was never not doing this. Got it. I was doing it when I was three and a half. I was doing it when I was eight. I was, I was so just... I, actually to that point, that practice pad you had, did you st- actually use it constantly until you were 12 like nah because i hated it so yeah. i still had it like i saw it about 10 years ago yeah and uh, i think i still have it somewhere in my attic i'm sure i there's no way i would have gotten rid of it maybe i did i don't know but yeah. um and that was that could have been like 20 apartments and houses ago <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. but um uh, i did see it like 10 years ago or something like that uh anyway so i would play on it a little bit but it was really ungratifying so yeah. I would just play rock and roll records on my bed. And then I'd it. take pots and pans and, and and boxes and anything that could make noise and play big and act like I'm, you know, yeah. act like I'm, you know, in Kiss or the Police or any yeah. of that when I was young. That's you know? awesome. And then, so yeah. then you know, I was in all these metal bands, right? Because I love huh. metal. I love the intensity of it. In, in Tampa, it's all death metal and metal bands. Yeah. And, you know, like Hessians and long-haired dudes. Um <laughs> So I was in all these metal bands and I went to USF for a year and I spent all this year learning uh, like the Bach violin concerto and E minor and Rachmaninoff and all of this stuff, orchestral stuff and really learning how to read music and do all this. And then by the time summer came around after the first year of college, I sucked on the drum set. I could play orchestral, I could play Mozart, I could play Chopin, I could play Rachmaninoff, but I all of a sudden like playing an ACDC track was hard again. I'm like, this sucks. This is what I'm doing. I'm not going here to like, I'm not, I mean, this is wonderful to learn because I want to be like Neil Peart, right? I want to be yeah. a smart, intelligent, yeah. multifaceted musician, but I couldn't do that and rock and roll. You know? yeah. So then the next year I got really disenchanted with it and I hated the music school there because everybody just, they hated me too. You know what I mean? I just didn't click. I wanted yeah. to be a rock star. I had long hair. You know, I wanted to go play stadiums. They all wanted to become musical music teachers, you yeah. know, and it was just a different scene. So I didn't get along with the, the, the kids that are the students there, really. Some of them I did. <clears throat> and then um, there was this giant drum contest uh, from Thoroughbred Music again and it and 98 Rock and all of these sponsors. And it went on for six months. Right. And I won unanimously. I smoked every. Oh. What kind of you a know. conflict you actually went up and competed against people in drum solos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. played drum solos. Yeah, at Nico's nightclub in Clearwater, <laughs> and uh, and I won unanimously. And all the best drummers in Florida were there judging it, and I, I smoked everybody because yeah. I mean, I lived at my parents' house. I could play ten hours a day. Yeah. You know what I mean? He was like yeah. men with jobs and responsibility. You know, it was, yeah. I had an unfair advantage. You know, yeah. plus I wanted it more than anybody. Yeah. And I remember Kenny Suarez was one of the judges. And nice. I mean, I just, and I practiced my drum solo. I remember I also had a job. I was going to college. I was playing and all that stuff. And I had a job painting apartments too. And oh. then when I got the call, like, hey, you made it into the semifinals. I'm like, I literally left my painting job right in the middle of it. I walked off the ladder. I said, yo, guys, I made it to the semifinals. I'm never going to get what I want. I'm just here for the money. Like I'm going to get more money winning the drum contest 
yeah. and more notoriety and I'll get the gigs I need. So I'm quit. And they're like, well, can you finish that? I'm like, no, 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 I, I'm done now. Like, <laughs> I'm, I gotta go, right? Like literally the second. Yeah. They're like, well, we need you to finish that. I'm like, yeah, I, I can't, I can't, I gotta go. And I left the job. I walked off the ladder and then I'm like, I can't, this makes no sense. There's yeah. no long-term, there's no long-term win here. So then I went and won. And then I hit the big time. Right? I got 42 band offers from all these top 40 bands. And wow. I was going to make, I was going to be the richest guy in the world. I was going to make, I ended up making, I got on this top 40 dance cover band and we were making $350 a week. I was rich. Yep. I mean, I was straight up on my way to becoming a multi-billionaire. Yeah. $350 in one week. Yeah. Who could ever make that much money? What would you do with that much? I mean, that was like, my mind was blown. But then I'm playing. I'm uh, literally 19. I, you know, I wasn't even old enough to be in the places, I think. Nin yeah, 19. And I'm playing with these 42-year-old, 44-year-old. And I'm looking at them going, they play a bunch of cover tunes. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've never been in a cover band. I've only been in original bands who are going to be rock stars and play stadiums. Right. Never been in a cover band so then I'm playing with these older people twice my age. We're down in Key West for six weeks playing, and it's great. And I'm just like, yo, that's not the jam. So then I left that, and I became a drum tech for this band, Crimson Glory. It was, there was only two bands, two rock bands in Florida at the time that had record. Bands. One was Sabotage, and one was Crimson Glory. And so I went out as a drum tech with Crimson Glory, and then... Uh, I end up taking that guy's job. Yeah. And they, they reformed the band and they reformed the sound and did this. So we were on Atlantic Records. I'm 21 oh, wow. years old now. At, yeah. By the time the record comes out, I'm touring the world. I'm on cover of magazines. Guns N' Roses and Metallica is underneath us in Metal Hammer and Kerrang. Yeah. Awesome. You know, and we're touring Europe. And it, it's a crazy, crazy story. We, um, uh, we had this terrible manager stole all kinds of money from us, just a thief. So then the guitar player, John Drenning, his cousin starts dating a guy in the Giganti family, the full mob family yeah. in New York, <laughs> right? And they're like, oh, now we're going to have him manage us, and he's got all the power, and he's a New Yorker, and he'll be able <laughs> to pull some strings. So now we're in bed with the Giganti family out of New York, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They got a construction company in Sarasota. Yeah. Yeah. Full, the whole deal, right? The whole bit. So, I mean, this is a movie, you know, from eight dollars from starving kid in India all the way now with, with the Giganti family, right? No. And um, and so you know, uh, so we're with them for a couple of years. They spend all this money, and they're arrogant, and they insult the record company. We're on Atlantic Records. We're about to make it, right? I'm making money. I'm on the cover of magazines. I'm 21, yeah. you know, just like, I'm like my, my, my life trajectory is going right where it's supposed to be, except the next move is I got to move to LA. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and we're doing it. And then <laughs> our record comes out the same week as nevermind. Right. Uh -huh. 91. Yeah. And we're like this good looking hair band, all dressed fancy. And just, you know, it's really funny. And um, takes over, and Nirvana comes up. Like, yeah. how could those guys? They're uglier than us. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that was my response. Like, who? What? That? Really? Yeah. They don't even look cool. You know? Like, it was such a retard. And uh, oh my god, delete that out. Um, you know, I was just uh, of a different opinion. So yeah. anyway, we go back. We go there. We go to Foundation Forum, which is this metal conference. And I saw at the Palladium. Alice in Chains, Pearl Jam, and maybe Temple of the Dog, and maybe it was Nirvana. I don't even remember. Um, I think it was because Seattle just was happening. and They were playing at the Palladium. We were there for Foundations Forum. It was like Rock Week in L.A. And rock and roll was so unbelievably, incredibly alive in 91 in, in L.A. Down Sunset. It was just awesome for rock and roll. Yeah. So then everything falls apart we go home it's crumbling i call my dad from there I'm like, dad look it's all it all just crumbled this guy's you know the 
the guys from the mob family are ruining everything. I'm going to pull my drums off the truck and I need you to send me some money for, um, for me to get an apartment. I can't leave. I need to stay out here. He's like, no, you went out there with them. You go home with them. You can't do that. It's unacceptable. Wow. I'm like, Dad, it's going to just fall apart and die. Sure enough, falls apart and dies. Next thing, you know, I'm working at the mall selling clothes to strippers and pimps and hookers. and Like a really slutty, druggy version of merry-go-round. Remember the store merry-go-round? Yeah. You know, like, so it was like just the, the rock and roll slut and whores and pimps and <laughs> all those people. I sold all their clothes to, right? All the strippers. And, and how was that in terms of a humble? Was it humbling or was it a, like, how did you look at it at that time? Like you went from on the cover of magazines on a rocket trajectory to getting, you know, punched in the face for her. Really, so. Yeah. Um, it was incredibly humble, you know, but you know, I was young and we were just figuring it out. That band crumbled. And then I helped put together a couple of versions new of that band. And, you know, the guitar player was this egomaniac that was just young and, egotistical and thought he knew everything and everyone else was just an idiot. And so yeah. it was his band, you know, yeah. so he ran it like a, like an idiotic dictator and it crumbled. And then yeah. finally I'm working at the mall and my dad comes to the mall and he's like, come here, let's go talk to you. What are you doing? What do you mean? I'm working, I'm making money. He goes, what are you doing? He goes, listen, you are wasting your life here. What you need to do is I'll help you. Go back to college, right? Finish, get your piece of paper. And the moment you get your piece of paper, I'll buy you a car and you leave and never come back to Pink. There's nothing for you here. You're wasting your life. This is not it. Leave this job, go back to school, and I'll help. He goes, leave now, but you need to leave the day you graduate. Go to LA. You're not meant for this. You can do it. I never had that shot. You need to take it. And I'm like, so he's like, you need to get your degree and go. So then I went back to school and I'm like, okay, I got to get out of here. I'm going to listen to yeah. it. So then you could take 12 hours was a full load. So I took 18 the first semester and now I was determined. Right. So, and I was older and I had so much failure. Right. <laughs> so I wasn't arrogant about anything. I'm like, let's get it done. So I had like, my GPA the first two years I was in the fraternity and drunk and whatever. Like I did nothing, you know, whatever. Just yeah. spoiled entitled, you know, all the young, dumb kids. Yeah, we all do, yeah. All of us, the whole bit. And um, so then I went back and every, I was just acing everything. I got all A's. So then I took 18 more credits. I'm like, this is nothing, but I got to go. Um, if I could take these other classes, I could knock it out. So then they were like, you can't legally take 21 class. I'm like, let me take it. I, I've gotten straight A's. Like, I can do it. And I'm playing five nights a week in wow. this other band with uh, Gumbi Ortiz, the greatest conguero on the planet. This guy was born in the Bronx, the hardest, meanest, baddest conguero on the planet. He literally stabbed his last drummer on stage in front of his family with the drumstick, right? So the guy's playing... It was on St. Pete Beach, right? And I kept asking Goomby, like, let me play with you. Let me play with you because he's the baddest. He would never let me play with him, right? Never, yeah. never. I'm like, and I used to take lessons from him, like congas and timbali and all that because I play yeah. Latin percussion, especially coming from Florida. It's like Cuba, right? Yeah. So yeah. I'm playing and I'm studying with him and we would go do drum lessons for six hours. We would play and I'd have to go play clave. <laughs> for two hours straight, yeah. I couldn't play another note. And if I played another note, he'd hit you. So hard. I mean, <laughs> so hard. He was so strong. Like each finger was this big. And he would like he would hit you. Not yeah. like, not like all woke hit. Like he would <laughs> like <laughs> the Bronx. Yeah. yeah. I would like, you know, you are so lucky to even be around me. Like yeah. you better you better respect this. I'll yeah. let you solo in about three hours. Yeah. <laughs> and you had to play clapping for hours. And then he would solo and play against you. And finally he would let you play. You know what I mean? And yeah. he's like, hey. When I was on the streets of the Bronx, man, I'd have to play clave. I had to do that for years before anybody let me play. Yeah. And it was just like, that's, that's it. You want to do it? You do it. And uh, so anyway, um, I'm playing with him in this, we called it voodoo hip hop, man. It was like this Afro-Cuban hip hop, funk, 
crazy thing, man. And it was wild, man. And in, insane. We would play one song for three hours, right? It would just mutate into all these different things. It was like a Cuban jazz, a Cuban jam band, right? And it was wild. And we played. So I'm playing five nights a week. Then I'm doing 18 hours. Then I'm like, I got to finish, man. If I can do 22 hours and 22 hours, I can get done and then I can leave. Yep. And so they were like, you can't do that. I'm like, I can do it. Just let me do it. Like, I'm doing the work. I'm getting the A's. I'm playing five nights a week. I'm nailing it. And they're like, well, you are. I said, I've got to finish and move to L.A. Like, I'm wasting time. Here. Like, the longer you waste my time here. But we legally can't do it. So my aunt was vice president of USF. Yeah. And she went and petitioned for me. And then she was like, this is illegal. But, but he's doing the work. He's getting the grade. If he doesn't get the grades, then, then don't give him the classes. So then they went through this whole thing. And she got it to where I could take 21 hours. Wow. <laughs> the 12 is a full load. I'm taking yeah. 21, right? And I'm like, I got to get done playing five nights a week, too. So yeah. then the Goomby Band gets a little record deal. We do a little thing. I graduate, right? I don't move. And then I put together this other rock band in addition. And then we start becoming like one of the biggest bands in Tampa, playing for 3,000 people a night. We're opening for every wow. national act coming through. We're on 98 Rock. We're doing it. We're doing it. And we are slaying. It's a band what was it called? The Crush. The Crush. The Crush? Nice. You know what? I'm going to go put that record out on Spotify. I mean, yeah. it's this great record that no one's ever heard. And we were full grunge. It was the grunge time. And we were really good. I mean, we were hard as nails. We could play. Great songs, great writing, really great rhythm section. Me and Jeff Lords were incredible together. The musicians were great, but me and the me and the guitar player just man, we butted heads every day about everything. You know, I, I sense he a was theme. Going, what? I sense a theme. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the same guitar player and bass player from from when we were with the Gigante family. We Got formed it. like four other bands in between. Um, <clears throat> so then. That gets going, and we're playing for 3,000 people. And I'm like, guys, we got to move to L.A. We got to move to L.A. We got to move to L.A. And they can't. They won't. They're just old now, you know. And, I mean, to be honest, like John Drenning, his mother was dying of cancer, right? I didn't understand what that meant at that time, right? I didn't know what loss was. All I knew was my ambition, right? I'm like, we got to move whatever you know like and it's like i just need to go sit with my mom i can't do these shows i can't do so i didn't understand that at all and i didn't give him any quarter for any of it. I'm like, you're just you're a bitch you know yeah. so i was i was very wrong and yeah. he was very wrong too I and mean, he was a dick about it too yeah anyway uh you know but i would say that's honest i just didn't understand what any of that meant because i'd never had any loss except for like yeah. my career losses you know yeah my ambition but you so then really, yeah go ahead because that, that's all i saw I, you know yeah. like i couldn't even you know i had the hottest girlfriends i'm like look you're fine for now but i'm leaving in a minute yeah and i'll be getting carmen electra as soon as i get there because i'm <laughs> robbie course. drums yeah exactly. <laughs> i wasn't even robbie drums then i was just robbie uh, <laughs> so then i come to la right and I look like an idiot, right? I got this stupid Rico Suave hair. Uh, the clothes are wrong. Everything's just a mess. I look like I yeah, exploded out of Florida and you're here in LA. It doesn't work. It takes a minute for everyone to get their look together and get their vibe together and get it yeah. tight and look proper and be hipster and you know, the whole thing, right? <laughs> and um, so I... Uh, I met this guy named Fez. I'm shooting a video for this electronic drum company called Acupad. And I meet Steve Perkins. And I go film him at Porno for Pyro. He's the drummer with James and Porno for Pyro. So we became great friends. I filmed Matt Sorum from Guns N' Roses. Yeah. We become great friends. I just talked to, I just saw Matt two weeks ago. Uh, nice. My kids, we brought him to the show at uh, Long Beach Grand Prix. And, um, and I, you know, I played with Matt just last year. Anyway, so I got to become friends with a bunch of drummers out here because of that. So that get, got me an access point um, yep. to, you know, just an entrance point. So I go to the Opium Den, Brent Bolthouse's Opium Den on Thursday night. Everybody's walking in, right? The yep. Chili Peppers, Jane's Addiction, just Pam Anderson and Tommy Lee or 
like all the chicks on General Hospital and Britney and NSYNC and Backstreet Boys. Everybody's walking into this tiny little club. They wouldn't even let me on the curb, right? They're pushing me off the curb. And me and Fez, Fez took me there. And I'm like, man, we got to get in. Like everybody, these are all my future friends. Like I got to know these people. Like this is the people I'm going to play with. Yeah. So I'm like, I need to play in this room because if I do one good show here, I could probably get an audition with any of these touring bands and then I can go. Yeah. So I meet Brent Bolthouse. Yeah. And I tell him, hey, man, you need to have me play here. He's looking at me like, why do I need you? And how did you even get in? Like, I said, listen, I just moved here from Miami. And I played drums with the DJs all over Miami. Lied. Um, yeah. Never did this once there. Um, I Wait, lied. Yeah, in, by the way, this is, like, this is 1989. No, no, no. This is a, uh, no, no. This is a uh, 97, 97, 97. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. 97. So I moved here in 97 and, uh, or maybe 98, maybe it's 98. I don't know. Yeah. It's, that range. That... In that range. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, uh, I'm like, listen, goes, why do I need you? It's totally annoyed. I'm like, listen, I will play drums with the DJ. People will dance more because they're dancing more. They'll get thirsty and they'll buy more drums. I said, I'll give you a thousand dollar guarantee. I had forty two dollars. Yeah. So finally, he said, I don't know. Go talk to this guy, DJ Spooky. And uh, so I went and talked to him. I had all these because I went and finished college. I got a degree in film, but I got a degree in film so I could make my promo videos. Yeah. <laughs> it's for me as a drummer. That's what I did. My dad was like, just get a piece of paper that says you did it. I've completed my job. Go. <laughs> so I did that, and uh, I had all this great video and promo and whatever. So he said, yeah, it looks cool. Come try it out. So Brent would have me play every other week for 50 bucks. Yep. It costs like $14 to park and 12 bucks. Yeah. So I walked out of there with no money, right? Yeah. And uh, and I think I got one drink ticket. I got 50 bucks and a drink ticket. Or something. <laughs> nice. Anyway, so I started playing there and then it just grew and grew and grew. And then uh, eventually I started playing. Everybody could, you know, it was the hottest club in town. So once you're there with yeah. Bolt House, everybody else wants you. So I started playing and I had a, you know, I was so ambitious. I had a job as a circle studios. It was a commercial production. House. Yeah. So I was a PA on jobs, right? I was production yeah. assistant on, on gigs for commercials. Or, yeah. Mainly commercials. <clears throat> and I was so ambitious about it that um, I became the office manager at this place. At the first place I worked, I did a Lincoln commercial, Lincoln uh, navigator commercial. First one I ever did. And um, yeah, I was just a PA. That's all I did. You know? yeah. and, and then I became the office manager. And then I auditioned for this one gig with this guy named Mickey Free. Mickey Free was a guitar player in this group, Shalimar. And there was some hustle they were running. There was some rich dude that had this ex porn star chick that wanted to become a singer. And so he funded her band. He started a magazine called Perfect Ten. So it was all chicks with like all natural, no, no fake boobs. Cause he wanted to be Hugh Hefner, the financier. And anyway, so I got in this band, I'm working full time at circle studios. I'm rehearsing every night with this band and then I'm playing multiple gigs a week. And then I burn out. I almost burn everything, all of it down except for the gig. So then. So were you just keep... speaking of the burnout thing? So like, did, were you just grinding too hard, working and playing and working and playing? Is that what happened? I was working all day at Circle Studios, and I was rehearsing with this band Monday through Friday, yeah. and then and then and, and then I was doing gigs. Yeah, I was just going for it, full out. And then I kind of burned myself out. I got fired from <laughs> Circle Studios. I got fired from the band, and wow. and then and then, but I kept my gigs. So, and then it, everything just moved that way. And yeah. I just started playing with DJs more and more often. I did all kinds of bands, all kinds of stuff. And it just grew. But the playing with the DJs grew. And then we got a Sunday night residency. Yep. Uh, Suck and BJ. And it used to be, what a, what a great combination. One guy's name was Suck Song. One guy's name was BJ. Suck and BJ. I swear to God. This is like the gigantic, <laughs> the story never stopped. And it's all true. Anybody yeah. that knows me knows all of this. They, they were there. Um, anybody in LA nightlife knows. Yeah. So Sunday nights was sin night, service industry night at the yep. foundation. It became the hottest thing on the planet. Hefner would come in. Everybody. And it, uh, House of Blues? Yeah. Nice. And, yeah. And, and then things just blew up for me there. And then I, then I started playing at Garden of Eden. Dave, David, 
David Judinkin brought me over there with Hermantown and, and all these other things. And then <laughs> Hugh Hefner <laughs> saw me. Hugh Hefner came and saw me there again. And then I got the gig at the Playboy Mansion. So I became a resident drummer at the Playboy Mansion for his four big parties a year. Midsummers, wow. Halloween, New Year's Eve, and his birthday. Yeah. So he would have four big ones a year. He'd have, he'd have more. The 4th of July one was really big. I never got to play that or go to that. But all the ones where he'd build the tent and all that. So I did those for years, and that made me a made man. I went from like 300 bucks to 500 to 1,000. Yeah. You know. And then, uh, and then it just grew and grew and grew and grew. And well, so, yeah. So at what point did you... Like, did it feel like I've made this, I've made it work? Or have you hit that point? Like, you know, you had this childhood dream of three and a half, you're going to be a rock star. When did you feel you had hit that? I headlined the first Coachella with Perry Farrell. And yeah. I ended up doing this long drum circle here where he did this Brazilian cleansing ceremony thing at the end. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit, because I was friends with all the people in No Doubt and 311. Yeah. And all of them were there on the side of the stage. They're yelling, like, like, dude, you did it. You know what I mean? Because, you know, they knew, like, you know. Um, and so that was really, maybe that was a moment where it felt like it happened. And then, you know, and then that went away and that went to shit. You know I mean? Like, you know, like it's all entertainment. Yeah. And, and I think being in entertainment is like a startup. One minute you're on a rocket ship, yeah. next minute you lost your funding and everything sucks and everyone's yeah. looking for a job. You know, yeah. I think that's what music is like, unless you're in a band that's constantly just going. And, yeah. you know, you know, you're going from gig to gig to gig, freelancing. And, you know, then I did a bunch of other gigs. I did this stuff with this artist, Lamia, for uh, Clive Davis. So I was living back and forth between the village and, and living at the W Hotel in Times Square yeah. on Sunset. I was living back and forth and traveling all over the world with her. And then, and then I just, you know, really started focusing on the DJ thing. I became a musical director for um, Paula Abdul, she had a TV show. Uh -huh. And Howie Mandel had a TV show. Yep. And I became a musical director on air and I wrote the theme song for both shows. Nice. So, you know, I don't know, man. There's been moments, yeah. you know, where you feel like you made it and the next day you're like, you know, you got to take the trash out. I did the Oscars, <laughs> you know, with, with A.R. Rahman. That was a beautiful wow. moment. I did the Super Bowl with Paula Abdul and Randy Jackson. And, yep. you know, Ryan introduced us you know i don't know there's been all these moments none of it ever feels like you made it now it just feels like a isn't good it, moment i would say isn't it interesting because like if you told yourself at five that's where you would be it'd be like get yeah, you believe it but you don't you know what i mean like you have all the confidence but at the same time you're like that's what i want then you get there and you're like okay what's next like you're kind of like all right that was cool yeah. that was fun. moving next like, all right, all right. like shit okay that's great yeah. i can make the car payment and yeah. <laughs> the last will stay out this month. Too. I get What's the next game? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Let's uh, drum up some work. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> oh, it's just you know, so and, then, and then I met I met you at the Upfront Festival, and that was a yeah. great day. You know, hanging yeah. out with all those billionaires and, yeah. and entrepreneurs and Not all the those. Worst you know, and then we hung out with Chris Dieter, and and yep. that He's was back. fantastic. And you know, now we're here. So I made yeah. it right now. Exactly. Yeah. Cheers, um, more. Cream. Cheers. Yeah, the water. Um, so a couple more questions for you. Number one, what's next? Like on that note, what do you think is coming down the pike? What are you excited about? Where's the dream taking you so now? What I am so excited about, I think I finally found my sound, right? I've always been trying to fuse, you know, electronic and acoustic, yeah. right? Here. Yeah. You look at this thing, right? It, the screen, you know, maybe you could cut in a picture of it. But yeah. here's the crazy drum rig. With electronic drums, yeah, oh, this is overhead and all around you. Yeah, it's it's everywhere, right? So yeah, yeah this, you see it. Yeah, there are those it. turntables too? Yeah, so my turntables are on the screen. Yeah, got it. So I, 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 it's like a transparent touch controller that I developed with NASA scientists for Paul wow. Abdul's TV show. Yeah, for yeah. real. I was a <laughs> I was a good Indian for a couple of days. I did the good Indian. So um, I felt I did my brown duty in that moment. Uh, but uh, so I DJ on the screen and then um, I've got some music coming out and it is really good. So it's tribal and I, I, I'm doing a couple remixes and songs with this group called Barbatucas from Brazil. And they got that big Brazilian chanting. Yeah. They got a, they got a song that like every DJ plays at every 
pool party or every beach or every sunset. In, if you're in Tulum or Mykonos or whatever, or Ibiza, Ibiza you, you'll hear it, you know, Bailana by Barbatukas. You would have heard it. You may yeah, not know the name, this at the other, yeah. it's killer. So I'm doing a couple songs with them. I was actually just putting one together today before I took my shower to clean up for this. Video. That's why I was doing it. Um, uh, so I'm doing that, and it's this big tribal sound with dance and electronic and I think it's really phenomenal. So I made, you know, breaking songs is so impossible, yep. right? Unless yep. you got a lot of money that you can just pay two hundred thousand yep. dollars to break, right? Which I don't have. Um, so I made a killer template that you know I'm trying to spread through, you know, the Coachella uh, while everyone's making all their videos afterwards and this and the other. So I'm trying to <clears throat> break the song in a template currently. I don't know what to do. It, it's just hard. So, but I think once I get these other remixes done with them and their label, then you know, maybe there'll be some proper support and we can really push that. Yeah. But my goal is to play every beach in the world this summer. <laughs> and have fun. I'm talking about that. <laughs> and love, you know what I mean? Actually, like, might have, Chris and I might have something for you. So we got to talk about that after this. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. In cans, we're talking about that. Oh, you are? All right, perfect. Yeah, because I'll yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'm going to play uh, in uh, in Athens. Hopefully that uh, gets a uh, great. Let's see. let's see if they book the flight. <laughs> And while you look at that, one last question for you. For you, you were so focused from a young age on your dreams, your goal, and you made it happen. Like, what's your advice to someone else, whatever that dream might be? To like, what is something you either wish you heard or you did hear that really helped you get there? Like, what? Oh man, yeah. So I was in music school, and <clears throat> this older lady percussionist. She was famous from like maybe she played with the, the Boston Orchestra or something like that. And she said something to me that just registered. For some reason, I'm remembering this right now. She goes, and Lionel Hampton told her this. And Lionel Hampton was one of the great marimba players in jazz mm -hmm. music. He said, there's a place for you in the music business. You just got to elbow everybody out of the way and take it. That's it. <laughs> you got to find it. If you want it, you yep. gotta, there, there's a place for you, 100%, for everybody at anything, whatever you want to do. But you got to make the spot. Because... I created something new, right? People are still like, what do you do? What band are you in? I'm sorry. You what? <laughs> really? I, I, you play drums and you do. Why? You know, still, you know, but I, I think if, you know, if maybe I had that hit record and, and everyone knew, then, then that would be the thing. But they, I don't have that hit record yet. Hopefully coming this summer. Yeah. There and, you yeah go. But I, I think that's it. You know, like there is a place for you. You just got to elbow everybody out of the way and, get in there well robbie drums has been awesome thank you so much for coming on hawk talk oh my god this is fun man this yeah. is exciting we'll talk soon